Today we're going to start on the time value of money. It's basic introduction to the time value of money. We're going to introduce the future value of a single sum of money. Your lecture last Friday covered an introduction to financial investments. There was a review of financial investments in general, talked about the participants in the financial markets, talked about investing in stock and in bonds. Also, we introduced the terms futures and options and explained a little bit how they might be used in the hedging framework. And that last bullet, risk and return, the uh, relationship between risk and return. Today, we're going to talk about the time value of money, which will form the basis by which we can analyze investments and capital budgeting decisions. I'm going to start with a pizza example. Uh, that you'll probably wonder what that's got to do with the financial management class, but hopefully I'll tie that uh, together at the end of the example. We'll talk about, in general, the concept of the time value of money. Then we'll talk about the future value of a single sum of money. The reading assignment is the time value of money in Chapter 9. Also, there's a handout to the War Financiers Air Request Amends, but it's in the website. Also, if you look in the front of your uh, handout of your notes in the table of contents, you will see there's a place that's called the Summary of Compounding and Discounting Formulas. That's a resource that's there for you because we're going to cover formulas. When it's all said and done, there's, there's four formulas there and you can use those, refer back to them so you see them written very, very concisely and compactly. Okay, let's start with the pizza example. And first of all, I want you to tell you this is a real problem. These numbers were not fabricated. One day uh, I was looking through pizza coupons, as you all get. The coupon said I could get a 1 16 inch pizza for $12, or I could get two 12 inch pizzas for $13.50. Now, my gut feeling is, is that I'm getting a lot more pizza for B because I would get two 12-inch pizzas for just $1.50 more. Now, I don't know what possessed me or why I did this, but I thought, I'd like to see which of these is truly better. I said, okay, how do I solve this? It cost me for pizza A, cost $12, and I get 16 inches of pizza. Okay, it cost uh, 75 cents per inch of pizza for A, and then for B, it cost me $13.50, but I get 24 inches of pizza. Two times 12 is 24, so that gives me a lot more inches of pizza for $1.50 more, so what does it cost me per inch of pizza? Is coupon B better than coupon A because it uh, cost me only 56 cents an inch of pizza, where the other cost me 75 cents? So the true mathematicians poke a hole in this, right? Can you eat a linear inch of pizza? No, it's you know, a ray. You can't. You don't eat a linear inch of pizza. You eat the area. We need to know the area. So what's the area of a circle? Pi r squared. Let's make some assumptions, though, so that we can analyze this pizza example correctly. First of all, let's assume that these pizzas have the same thickness. If they had different thickness, then we'd have to use volume. Let's also assume that you're indifferent between crust and toppings because there's obviously differences in crust and topping in these type of pizzas, so you're indifferent. We could solve that problem, but that isn't the purpose of this class. The other assumption is, is that you can't be satiated with pizza. You'd be just as happy with three pizzas as one pizza. In other words, if you had three pizza, even though you couldn't eat it all today, you could nuke it tomorrow in the microwave and you'd be happy. Now, how do we evaluate this pizza? We have coupon A and coupon B. We're going to measure this pizza instead of linear inches or we're going to measure it square inches. Okay. To do square inches we have to have the area. The area of a circle is a pi r squared. And pi is equal to what? 3.14159. So what's the area of the first pizza? So the area of pizza A is 3.14 one times, and the radius of a 16, 16 inch pizza is eight, right? So you square that, and so the area, if you do that arithmetic, is you have 201.056 
square inches. So we take the price now, do the same analysis we did before, only with the area. So we take the uh, $12 and uh, divide it by 201.056 square inches, and what does that come out to be? That comes out to 059. So it's, it costs approximately six cents a square inch of pizza. Now let's look at uh, the area of the of the second coupon. That's 3.141 times, and here we have 12 inch pizzas, so the radius is six. We square that. 113.09, and there's two of those, right? So in this case, we're actually getting a 226.188 square inches of pizzas. There's only 201 for the first coupon, we're getting 226 for the second. But it costs us $13.50 we divide that by the 226.188. So what do we conclude? <laughs> Holding those assumptions that we made, we'd be indifferent between coupon A and coupon B because they both cost us the same per square inch of pizza. What that tells us is, is that somebody at Domino's did their homework. So what's this got to do with the financial management class? Actually very little, except for this. When we did the analysis, to try and determine which of the coupons were better, and we did it as linear inches, the analysis looked good, it was plausible, but what was the result? It was wrong. To do it correctly, we had to do it using the area. And when we did an area, we had to know a formula. The point is now, as we move into investments and the allocation of resources through time, and we have sums of money through time, if we evaluate those sums of money through time by adding them together, it's like evaluating a pizza with linear inches. It looks good, it's easy, it's plausible, but it gives you the wrong answer. So we have to take these sums of money and we have to use a mathematical relationship <coughs> to solve that problem. And if we don't know those formulas, and if we don't use those formulas, we're going to get the wrong answer. Now, this is my way of motivating us before we get into the trees because in the next few weeks we are going to learn equations. And these equations that we're going to learn are every bit as important as the area of a circle. And maybe more so because it has to do with your wealth or the wealth of the company that, you're, that you manage. So we're stepping into the trees now with hopefully that as a backdrop that there is a reason for memorizing and understanding the formulas dealing with the time value of money. Let's talk now about the exchange of money between the present and the future. You know, this goes back to the theory of finance where we're looking at exchanging resources through time. Well, here we're talking about money. One of the statements that we can make is, is that an individual prefers present dollars over future dollars. And to bring this a little closer to home, if I was to ask you, which would you prefer? A thousand dollars today, not tied to any risk, to give you a thousand dollars today, or I give you a thousand dollars at the end of the semester. Which would you take? So I think we can safely say that in this brief experiment that you agree with this statement. People prefer a dollar today, a present dollar, more so than the same dollar in some future period. Why? So let's assume away inflation and risk and, and all of that. Let's just look at the just a dollar <coughs> amount. If you had a thousand dollars today, what could you do with it? Okay, one, you could use it to pay your tuition, right? But let's say that your tuition is paid, your rent's paid, everything's okay. That's excess money that you didn't expect. What would you do with it? You would invest it. Put it in the bank or some other interest drawing or some other return bearing security. Even if you weren't going to spend it or consume it today, you would still prefer the money today because you could invest it and earn some kind of uh, interest on it. That's why we prefer the money today as opposed to later because we can either consume it today, which we prefer consumption today, or we could invest it where we, consumption would be greater in some future uh, time period. That same logic can hold if I was to ask you to lend me money. That's a little more difficult, but again, Assuming that there's no correlation between your grade and this decision, 
and there's no risk. If I ask you to lend me $100 or $1,000 today, and I promise that I will, without any risk, give you that money back at the end of the semester, how many of you would lend me that money? You have some disincentive, because what could you do with that money? And even if there was no risk, you probably wouldn't do that because of the foregone money that you could earn. But if I said, with no risk again, if you lend me $1,000 now, and assuming you have it, and I promise to give you $2,000 at the end of the semester, now you're interested, aren't you? And, and some of you, if I offered, if you give me $100 and I promise to give you $120 at the end of the semester, many of you would be interested because that would be close to 100% return on an annual basis. What is it required to get you to lend me money? Compensation. If I provide you compensation for that foregone investment or consumption, that money that, that you have in your pocket right now, if I compensate you for that, then you might be interested, if I compensate you enough. Now it's interesting because if you hear in the news about interest rates, they talk about those mean lenders that charge these high interest rates, you know, like interest is a bad thing. Interest is a price. Interest is just a price of an exchange of money through time. If I need the money now, the interest that I pay you is the price that I get you to foregone your consumption and investment to let me use your money. If you want an education at A&M and you don't have enough money saved and you have to pay tuition, then you can get somebody to lend you the money and they're willing to do it because you're willing to compensate for them. You're paying them interest on it. You've learned the price of corn, price of cattle, you know that the price is set so that the supply of corn is equal to the demand of corn. That there's an equilibrium price set so that the, that clears. Well, you got the same thing in the exchange of money through time. It's just that the interest rate is the price that fluctuates up and down so that if somebody wants to borrow money, they can, so it clears. Okay, this is an introductory class and we have to learn vocabulary. And one is the idea of equivalence. What we're going to do is learn how to convert cash flows in one period, or later on multiple periods, into an equivalent amount in some other period given a specified interest rate. A compounding converts a present amount of money into an equivalent future amount. If you look at a timeline, and if we have money in 2008, and we want to know what its equivalent value is in 2010, then we take that sum of money and we compound it to its value in 2010. So when you think about compounding, we are taking money in the present when we are converting it to an equivalent amount in some time in the future. We're going from left to right. Discounting converts some future amount of money into an equivalent present amount. Again, on the timeline, if, if we have some sum of money in 2010 and we want to know what its equivalent amount is, then we discount it going from right to left on the timeline to the present amount. That's what we've referred to as discounting. You can think of it as this. A dollar today is not the same as a dollar sometime in the future. You can think of those as apples and oranges. They are not the same. They are different. What we are trying to do is take an apple today and convert it to a, an equivalent apple in the future. Or vice versa, if we have the apple in the future, we want to bring it back as an equivalent amount in the present. And we're going to look at formulas for creating this equivalent amount. Now that we already know that we can't evaluate dollars through time is the same. And if we do that, evaluating the time value of money or money just like what we did with the pizza, evaluating the pizza's linear inches. It looks good, it's quick, it's easy, but it's wrong. Looking at specifically at compounding, it, as we mentioned before, converts earlier present sums of money to future sums of money. Money grows. What this means is interest is added to the principal, and then interest is paid on the interest. The conversion period is the period of time that principal accrues interest before interest is added to the principal. If you have your money invested in the bank 
and it's compounded annually. You put your money in the bank and it sits there accruing interest till the end of the year. At the end of the year, let's say you have $1,000 in, in the bank, drawn 10% interest. At the end of that year, you have $100 worth of interest. That interest now becomes part of the principal. And from that point on, you're getting 10% not only on the $1,000, but also on the $100 of, of interest. If it's compounded monthly, then at the end of the month, the bank converts that interest to principal and from thereafter earns interest on the interest. Suppose you can put money in a savings account that earns 6% compounded annually. When we say compounded annually, that means the conversion period is one year. How much money would you have in your savings account in 40 years if you invested $1,000 today? Let's break this up into its component parts. Let's first ask the question, how much money would you have in your account after one year? This is compounding annually. Okay, I'm gonna bring some notation into play here. The V represents value, the value of a single sum of money. It's subscripted one. That subscript represents the time period. One means at the end of the first year, first period. And the question is, is if you put $1,000 in that bank, at the end of the year, you would get that principal back. So you'd have $1,000 plus you'd have interest. In addition to the principal amount, you have the interest. And the interest is the $1,000 principal times the 6%. If you look at the formula, you have $1,000 in each of the components. You can factor that $1,000 out and you have 1,000 times one plus the interest rate. If you do the arithmetic, then at the end of the first year, you'd have $1,060. How much is interest? $60. You have the $1,000 principal plus the $60 in uh, interest. How much money do you have in two years? In this case, in the second year, we have the principal of 1060 which includes the original principal plus the $60 in interest, and we have interest on that new principal amount. Notice that the 1060 can be rewritten as 1000 times 1 plus 0 0.06, and I've circled the two equations so you can see where that's coming from. And I do that in both these components so that you can see that I can factor out 1000 times 1 plus 0 0.06 in both components. That allows us to rewrite this formula as 1000 times 1 plus the interest rate times 1 plus the interest rate. And we can simplify that further by using exponent. So if we look at the value in the second year, we basically take the original principal of $1,000 and we multiply that by one plus the interest rate raised to the second power. We do the arithmetic and it comes out to $1,123.60. So after two years of having that money in the bank account, what's our interest? $123.60. Now you can see there's a pattern here and we could continue to do this as long as we wanted, but there's a pattern. What do you think the formula would be to calculate the amount of money we would have in the bank at the end of three years? It'd be the original principal times one plus the interest rate raised to the what power? The third power. And the end of four years, the fourth power. That allows us to come up with a general formula. And the formula that we have looks kind of scary at the beginning, but if we dissect it, it's not that bad. Recognize that the V represents the value of a single sum of money. That's subscripted depending on the period of which we get that money. Notice that the little n and the big n denote some point in time where the big n is in some future period of time relative to the little n. And you can see that very clearly on the timeline that the big n is some point to the future of the little n. R represents the interest rate or later rate of return. If we look at this then, if, if we have this V little n, some present sum of money, some value in present terms, and we want to know what its value is going to be in some future period of time, that V big n, we take the value at the little n, the present period of time, and we multiply it by one plus the interest rate raised to the number of period power. And we get the number of periods by taking the big n and subtracting out the little n. And that gives us the number of periods that that, that money's compounded. Now we can simplify that formula and simplify it to the formula that is frequently used in the textbook by saying let's let that little n be zero. That means let's start on the timeline today where the time starts today at time zero. 
that little n equals zero becomes the present. That allows us to rewrite this formula then where we're looking at the future value of some single sum of money today. So we're taking that V subscript naught as today, the present amount of money. We're taking that amount of money today that we're putting in the bank. And if we want to know what that is going to be in n periods in the future, we take that present amount, B naught, and multiply it by one plus the interest rate raised to the n power, which, rec which represents the number of periods that it compounds. Because we're going to live and die by this formula now. There's going to be four of them, but this is the first one in the series that we have that we need to learn. But I want you to have the intuition behind it as well. Now, our original question was, if we put $1,000 in the bank, drawn 6% for 40 years, how much will we have in our bank account at the end of 40 years? I want to show the problem in a timeline. Notice that I've drawn a line. And on top of that line represents the timeline where it's designated or denoted as a period of time. In this case, the zero represents today, the present. The 40 represents the end of the 40th period. If I had one up there, it would be the end of the first period. If I had five, it would be the end of the fifth period. Underneath, I represent the V or the value of that money at that point in time. So if we look at time zero, we have a negative $1,000. And the reason that I uh, put negative $1,000, even though that $1,000 is still ours, we are giving that money out of our pocket to the bank. We no longer have access or use of that money. The bank does. Thus, I put a negative $1,000. What we want to know is, is if we give that bank the $1,000 today, how much are we going to have at the end of 40 years? In this case, 40 periods, drawn 6%. Notice that under 40, I have V subscript 40, representing the value at the end of the 40th period. To the right of the timeline, I put R equals 6%, so we know that we are dealing with an interest rate of 6% for this problem. The next thing I'm going to do on problems is I'm going to show which formula to use. And by the way, this format is the exact same format that I expect for you to use on your homework. We see that we want to know the future value of a known sum of money today, so we use this formula, the future value of a single sum of money. Okay, we plug in the numbers, we see that V naught is the $1,000 that we put in the bank today. We substitute the R for 6%, which is the interest rate, and the number of periods is 40. So that's the formula that we use, and those are the numbers that we plug into the formula. Now, all of you can solve that with a calculator that has an exponential function. But now is the time to introduce the use of your financial calculators. What I want you to do then is look on the buttons on your calculator. I want you to put 40 in the button that says N. And I want you to put 6, not 0.06, but 6 in the button that's got interest rate. And I want you to put a negative 1,000 in the button that says PV or it looks like a PV or has a, something that corresponds to that. You need to zero out the button that has payment. Now it's important to zero out payment because what you find is the calculators nowadays have memory. And if you don't zero it out and it's got something in there from a previous problem, it'll corrupt your problem that you're working with. So zero it out. Uh, some of you will just push the button that says PV. Some of you will say compute. There's a little button that says compute PV. So it depends on your calculator. And you should come up with the answer, which is $10,285.72. Some of you may have a negative $10,285.72, which means that uh, your calculators, you wouldn't put a negative here. You'd put it in as a positive. The HP and the more advanced calculator, it's going to recognize, as I do on the timeline, you have a negative coming in and you got a positive coming out. Or if you got a positive going in, you got a negative coming out. Also, some of you may not have gotten that answer because your calculators are set for 12 payments per year. And they do that because most people that buy the calculators use them to calculate their car payment or their house payment. And those are usually monthly payments, so they're automatically set. In this class, we're not going to do that. If you set it that way, you're going to do it because you know what you're doing. Okay, another way to solve the same problem is with spreadsheets.
spreadsheets, uh, Excel or one, two, three, or whatever spreadsheets you want to use. I'm going to show the formulas in Excel because you have access to those in all the computer labs. The formula that you're going to use to uh, calculate the future value is this formula. You type in equals future value, then you put parentheses your rate. The rate is at uh, 6%. Notice, however, that in Excel you're going to put the decimal form, 0.06, whereas your calculators you use the percentage. So that's the difference that you'll have to recognize. Then the number of periods, which in this case is 40. The payment, we zero it out. The present value, in this case, was 1,000. And then this type has to do whether it's beginning period or ending period cash flows. And in this case, all the payments are due at the uh, end of the period, so we put in a zero. And I suggest on your own leisure, you play with these formulas because out there when you start interviewing for jobs or you start work, it's good to understand where those are at and how to use these formulas.